morning, everyone, and welcome. It's a great pleasure for us to have David Bay with us here today within the framework of our seminar series called EDGES. This is our second seminar. Our first seminar was with Stina uh, David Bay is the Regional English Language Officer based at the U.S. Embassy in Ankara. He worked in Central Asia, Russia, and the Andean region of Latin America before serving as the branch chief for the U.S. Department of State's Office of English Language Programs. Quite a big name. Born in Davenport, uh, Iowa, he calls Turkey and the U.S. home. From 1991 to 2003, David lived and worked in Izmir and Istanbul, playing various roles in the ELT world, including teaching, training, and publishing. He holds a master's degree in English language education from Temple University, Philadelphia, where he also taught for several years. And today, his talk will be on critical thinking in the digital age. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? If I speak loudly enough, all right. I, I, it's easier if I move around, and because you're so many, you're making me nervous. So I'm going to have to move around a lot. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rosalvana. Thank you to your team for inviting me to your university. Uh, are we in uh, in Ankara or are we in uh, Bursa? <laughs> we drove so far from Ankara that I was wondering. If now, this is a, it's a beautiful spot. You're very lucky to be here. Um, you've got fresh air, and I can see you all look very healthy. <laughs> Much healthier than people um, living in um, Kuzalai or Ulus, but then maybe some of you commute. Does anybody come and go from downtown Ankara to come out here? How many of you? Almost everybody. Wow. Okay, so you come out here for fresh air. <laughs> Good. Um, how many of you are students in the English Language and Literature program? Students. Okay, so we've got sort of extending up that way. Um, do we have students from other faculties then? Which faculties? Just shout them out. Which faculties? <laughs> Computer <laughs> Engineering. <laughs> Computer <laughs> Engineering. What other faculties? <laughs> Uh, other faculties? What other faculties? Tra How many from translation and interpretation? Okay, very good. Any other faculties? Is there only one computer scientist here? <laughs> the three of you. Where are your glasses? I thought all computer scientists wore glasses. <laughs> Alright, so what I'm going to... Yes. International trade, good. Well, you are all welcome. Uh, what I have, I think I've got, how many, 10 hours? <laughs> 10 hours? All right. And at the end of the 10 hours, we give them an exam. Yes. Right? Okay. Um, so in the, in the uh, roughly hour or so that I have with you, what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about this topic up here. I also expect it to be hands-on. I do not expect you to sit back and not speak at all. So you will be working in groups throughout the workshop. Um, and I hope that when you're in your groups, you take it as an opportunity to practice your English as well. I'm still practicing my English. So I'm assuming that you, too, are practicing your English. Uh, a healthy suspicion of the text. There is um, a wonderful reading expert based in London, um, Amos Paran. Amos Paran. He came to Turkey about, oh, the first time, maybe about 20 years ago, and then almost every year he's been back. Um, maybe he has not been here for the past five years or so, um, but he is a reading expert who came up with this, this expression, a healthy suspicion of the text. Suspicion, is that a negative or a positive word? It's a negative word. It's kind of a negative word, isn't it? It's, it carries a little bit of negative weight. Healthy, on the other hand, should be a positive one. 
and it represents the two sides of what probably should be our approach given the bombardment of content um, that we face in today's world. Uh, I've got a, a picture up here of something that is a little bit difficult to recognize. Um, can anybody see what it is? Where, where would you find a piece like that? Egypt or the Anatolia, very good, in a museum. In the Middle East, very good, perhaps in a museum. I don't know if you can see very well, there are some hieroglyphics around the outside, so if you said Egypt, you are spot on. Um, the figure that you can really not see here and here is the same person. It's, it's the daughter of Ramses VI. And she is offering something to two different gods. There's a sun god here and a god of gods, the, the big one, the giant boss, who's over here. And it's basically what they call a stella, a stone. But we also call this a tablet. What's a tablet today? <laughs> now, if we were to go back several thousand years to when this tablet arrived, would it have been new technology? Yeah. Yes. So what we see as technology is very different from what they saw as technology back then. Now we're dealing with a digital world. I, I suppose we could call this part of the analog world, but nonetheless it's new technology. And I wonder, when people looked at that, whether they had a healthy suspicion of this text. Did the people who, re who read this wonder how true it was, how real it was? Did they think that perhaps something was being imposed on them from above? Or did they consume it without much of a question mark? I'm guessing that there were some doing both. And I'm also guessing that as you are surrounded by a lot of different text and content, you too have to develop this healthy suspicion. So let's take a look at what that means. New technology. So, I'm going to start with a definition. This is the, the, the boring part, so you're going to have to stick with me through this, okay? This is a fairly long definition of what critical thinking is probably about. Does this have a laser? Not sure it does. The website down here, criticalthinking.org, you can file that away, is a wonderful website. Um, I encourage you to visit. There are a lot of additional materials on the website. And if you are going to be a teacher in the future, how many of you are thinking about teaching? <laughs> <laughs> Ten years from now, how many of you will be in a classroom teaching? We see a few teachers, all right. Nobody else has put their hand up. Okay, well, when I was... When I was your age, I probably would not have put my hand up either until I got into the classroom and found that I truly did enjoy it. So take a look at this right now, and I'd like you to So if you don't get the answer right, I can zap you. <laughs> I'd like you to take a look at this and just turn to the person next to you and, and tell them what you think are the most important words in this definition. What are the key words in this definition?
anti-definition. And sometimes I wonder, I, I had a very different experience growing up. When I was in high school, the information was fed to us. We sat there, we memorized it, and then on the exams, we regurgitated it. We, we spit it out. <laughs> and if we spit it out well, we got a good, a good grade. I get to college, and all of a sudden, I start taking some interesting classes. Some Shakespeare analysis classes, some philosophy classes, some history classes that made me question the history that I was given during my high school. And I thought the transformation that I felt I went through, not in all of my classes, but in many of my classes, was to go from this, which was the approach that I had when I was in high school, to the real definition of critical thinking, which was to give some very controversial content that we had to think about. I hope that's what you're going through as well. Because I think that's this is the time to do it. This is the, the, the chance that you've got as far as your age is concerned and as far as your own learning cycle is concerned. So I hope this is what's going on. So let's, let's move now. I'm not going to get into that. Let's, let's have some fun. So here's what we're going to do. Um, you are going to be working in fairly large groups because I think I only have about 30 of these things. So the large group is probably going to be, for example, these two rows together. All right? So these two rows are going to work as a group. I'm going to give them an envelope. The envelope has a number one on it. Doesn't matter who, but somebody will open this up and they will have two puzzles. One puzzle on this side and one puzzle on the back side. Please don't write on these. There are questions to guide you. There are questions to guide you. Follow the instructions, follow the questions, and spend a couple minutes thinking about the why, because that's the important thing. Why did you find out whatever you found out? Where, where is that coming from? What's, what's going on in your brain for you to come up with that answer? Okay? When you're done, this group will put the paper back inside, close it up, no need to seal it, close it up, raise their hand up and try to exchange it with a group near them and get a different number. There are four envelopes. I have, I think, six or seven copies of envelope one, six or seven copies of envelope two, and of envelope three, and of envelope four. I will give you maybe 20, 25 minutes to work through. See if you can get through all four envelopes Maybe somebody in your group needs to stand up and walk over and find a new envelope, okay? See if you can get through all four in the 20 minutes or so, and then we'll talk about that, okay? So I'm going to talk, I'm going to ask my colleague Aisha Gunn, who is um, also an accomplished teacher. Thank you. 
It's a content word. It's a bigger word, and it's a content word. What words up there are the ones that really carry meaning? Paris Spring. There's also a formulaic nature, what we call formulaic wording or formulaic approach to language, where we have formulas in our brain. And this looks like the title of a book, of a poem, of a movie, and we would never expect to have two thus. There's one other theory, and I thought this young man had a very good hold on it. He said something about the shape, the fact that it's in a triangle. I have not tried it outside of a triangle, but my guess is the fact that the the comes down into a corner of the triangle also means that your eye is not looking at that. But you've got a play on words, and you've got a visual play. And again, something to think about as we're trying to process content from a lot of different sources, including visual sources. And the idea of the connection between the visual and the linguistic is key in today's world, especially in the digital world, because we're getting messages with emojis, with visuals, we're getting links immediately to YouTube videos. Um, all of these, this interplay between text and visual is key in today's world. And you have to have a healthy suspicion not only of the text, but of the visual as well. And we'll see that in a second. Not yet. Let's do one more language-based. So, what's your answer? Would you rather a Sebus Kondal attack you or a Von Cat? Von Cat. Why? How harmless a cat, a cat can be? How harmful can a cat be? Um, yes. I don't know. Do you own a cat? Vicious. But then, you've got the Congo. Well, the, if you anger the dog, he might throw it to pieces. He might, yes. And the cat probably wouldn't, right? Yeah. But don't cats jump up and just grab you by the neck? <laughs> um, they're both beautiful animals, uh, but there's something about this question. Did anybody see an issue with the question, Dole Khan? Explain. Okay, there's another way. Did everybody understand what he's saying? Yes. Okay, would you rather a Sivas Congo attack you? Would you rather a Sivas Congo attack a Von Cat? So you've got two possibilities for reading it. If you are looking at the language of law, if you are looking at the language of law, do we have any forms? Do we have any bukuk? You should back. If we did, they might be willing to point out some very important legal uh, issues and legal gray areas with wording like this. And it's something as people, and it sounds like the vast majority of you are in the linguistics game, either through literature or translation, that this kind of distinction is key. It can make a huge difference, as we can see with this particular question. Language still counts very highly. Um, another linguistic one, this is from a famous movie. I grew up watching these movies. Did anybody see this? The Pink, the Pink Panther? Seen it? Very funny movies. He's a great comedian. Uh, wonderful. Very, very bright. Peter Sellers is his name. Um, what's the assumption he makes? The wrong assumption. Dog near the man is not his dog. Very good. And if you saw if you saw the movie itself, and you can YouTube, you can go into YouTube Inspector Clouseau dog scene, you will find something like this. Yes. Very good. He should have asked, "Is it your dog?" Which he didn't. So it's a fallacy of proximity. 
because of the proximity, there's no other dog around there, it's a closed space, he just assumes that it is his dog. Again, it's a connection between the language and the visual side of things. And often we make these mistakes. Another trap that's easy to fall into. You're never too old to learn. Something that I think is important for anybody in the education field. Lifelong learning. What's the expression now in Turkish? <laughs> An important focus. A very, very important focus of education. Anybody can change their career at any age whatsoever. But there's an expression on the right side that is the opposite of it. Which one? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. This one right here. How about this one? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Out of sight, out of mind. The pen is mightier than the sword. Actions speak louder than words. Silence is golden. The squeaky wheel gets the breeze. This is a big issue for those of you who are going into education. In the classroom, there's often one who speaks out. And if, as a teacher, you give that person too much attention, then you forget the other ones. And that person who makes a lot of noise could be positive noise or negative noise. But that is a big issue in education. How about this one? Clothes make the man. Marriage is a book by scholars. Very good. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Don't be the dead horse. <laughs> and he who hesitates is lost. Very good. I was brought up with these adages from grandparents. And in Turkey, there are some beautiful expressions as well. But what's interesting is you could live by these expressions, right? But I've already shown you that there are opposite expressions as well. Equal and opposite. So are they something you can live by? Maybe for certain contexts. Maybe for certain contexts. They are two different They're two different philosophies. Yes, yes, they are. They are. And they're often thrown out whenever the situation is correct. But I think it's very important to be able to integrate them. Explain. To embrace them all, to the polarities. Mm. How would you embrace both of those polarities? Well, understanding what they mean. Okay. And how to integrate them in my own life and experience. Good, good. I think you could apply these equal and opposite sayings, for example, to a good novel as well, to different actors or characters within the novel, and you could pull out different strands and see how those two interact, perhaps. I think one, in some cases, can justify the other. I'm not sure if that's where you're going with this, but I would agree. I would agree. Life is not always just one side, is it? Very good. Thank you. Um, how about this email? Any issues with it? Spam. Yeah. Spam. Thank you. And why do you say it's spam? What jumps out at you? EBay. eBay person. eBay person. EBay person. Buying information right there. Misspelling and billing. Very good. Capital B as well. Wouldn't have worked. What else? Very good. The link. Uh, where was the link? There. With an extra E. And there are lots of people which is trying to manipulate you. to take your concentration to another point. Okay, such as? I mean, the things explain her, you know, doesn't make sense to me. That's why I keep that. Okay, all right. Sure, it's the combination of a lot of things here. But again, you're wise to these things, and a lot of people are still not used to them. Um, and it's something that's difficult to deal with. These are emails that we can get on a fairly regular basis, and something that we need to have a healthy suspicion of. Um, the visual side of things. 
this is a true story from, I want to say it was probably about maybe seven years ago, six years ago. Um, if you take a look at this picture right here, this was the first picture that came out. And then on the blog, it was an official blog, they had to get rid of this picture and they replaced it with this one. Why? Why do you think they replaced it? The watch. What about the watch? A very expensive one. And what would that mean if it's very expensive? Uh, this means the, ch the church leader might have been using the donations to the church for his own gain? Could be. It could be. Just a nice gift as well. He's a very important man. A very, very important man. He got a gift. but. Often we think of the humility for anybody in the service of anything, including government service, and yet there is this amazing watch. So they used Photoshop and they got rid of the watch. But what happened? Did they completely get rid of the watch? Do you see any problem with their Photoshop? The reflection. The reflection. They forgot to get rid of the reflection. And so they were able to continue with this story in the news because of that. These digital images, as you know, and as you are able to do on your phones now, are easy to manipulate. They're very, very easy to manipulate. And it's not only a healthy suspicion of the text that we need to worry about, but a healthy suspicion of the visual, of the image. So let's go to the last two. These were the most difficult ones. There were two articles. This is the second one. This is the first one. My instructions were to skim the first two paragraphs in both of these articles and look at the differences. Does anybody who did this want to comment? Yes. Um, the first article is from the perspective of the streets, the protesters. The other one is from the perspective of the official government press. Very nice. Okay, well, putting the official side to the side for just a second, notice the first two paragraphs here. Demonstrators are still standing their ground. The protests entered the 12th day on Saturday. You might remember this moment in history. It was a fairly important one, a major change in Egypt, something that was going down in downtown Cairo. Where is the reporter standing? in this article. Where's the reporter standing? Uh, in the center. In the center of the city, down the street level. We go to this one. Take a look at this one now. Where's the reporter? Just one of the who? Group. In which group? The demonstrators? Yeah. Not the demonstrators. But the government. It's not clear where this reporter is. For all we know, this reporter might be sitting in London, or Washington, or Tokyo, or somewhere else. It's not clear. This looks like something pulled together, probably from Reuters, or Associated Press, or one of the other general media outlet. It's not clear. So we have a reporter who seems to be on the ground, very detailed description of what's going on in the streets. Notice towards the end, they do talk about the official side, right here. This is not the complete article, it's only part of it, nor is this the complete article. But it's very important that both articles cover the same information, but in different amounts and with a different emphasis. One beginning with official, moving towards the protest. The other beginning with the details of the protest and then towards the official. Same chunk of news. Notice where this one's coming from. Al Jazeera. One of the outlets that I use to get news from the Middle East. How about this one? Mainstream U.S. outlet, which is probably why they don't have a reporter here. 
But do we think about these things as we're reading? Is the reporter there? Are they getting it from some other news outlet? What is the news outlet? Does the news outlet have an agenda itself? Are they trying to de-emphasize something and emphasize something else? This is what we're surrounded by, whether we like it or not. It's what we're surrounded by. And I'd like to think that during our days, certainly at the university, we have a lot of opportunities to explore these things, not only in an analog way from books, which are also important, but also because of the digital um, bombardment that we are living with. Um, how many of you have a phone with you right now? Ten years ago, how many hands would be up? The students who were sitting in these seats ten years ago, what do you think? 100% of the hands went up. Ten years ago, what percent? Maybe 50, 60%? 20 years ago? 40%? Maybe even less. Five. That's my guess as well. All right. Um, so, if you're, if you're um, interested in uh, being in contact with us, we have a couple of Facebook pages here um, that I can recommend. I do have a handout. I'm not sure I have enough handouts for everybody. Uh, but I will leave the handouts on the table. There are some journals out there, English teaching forum journals. Uh, they have, if, these are for English teachers or future English teachers. If it's something you think you might be finding yourself in the midst of, please grab some of these and take them with you. There are articles about how to inject critical thinking into the classroom. And then finally, I'll leave you with this. Um, do any of you know what Coursera is? Coursera edX? What is Coursera? Um, so these are, again, mostly free. In fact, the courses are pretty much all free, but when you go in to sign up, they'll ask you if you want a verifiable certificate for which you have to pay a cer certain amount. I have never done that verifiable certificate, but these, um, these are specifically for developing English, but this course is a course that we help develop that's focusing on media literacy. We also have one called English for Journalism, um, similar in some ways, that focuses specifically on the field of journalism. So if you're interested in taking a free course to explore critical media literacy a little bit more, I encourage you to go to Coursera. Uh, I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Do you have any questions? <coughs> Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you.